Air, so precious and mysterious that searching among the billions of stars and planets in our galaxy, we know of only one sure place to find it. This invisible layer wrapped around Earth is the delicate canopy surrounding our planet, making life possible. In its pure form, we can't smell, taste, or even see it. And only as it passes as an afternoon breeze do we feel its presence. But is air really invisible? Is it possible that there might be a way to see it with something other than our senses? Yes, I think so. It's 1.42 a.m. Maria Rodriguez takes her first breath. But the air that fills her tiny lungs had its own birth almost five billion years ago. As the Earth was born, so was the air that surrounds her. Gases released from fiery beginnings swirled around the new planet. Over time, volcanoes and planetary eruptions spewed more gases, trapped by Earth's gravity. Microscopic bacteria began to grow on the Earth's surface. A balance was achieved between the Earth, the Sun, and the air. And so it was for billions of years until the rise of man. And in the blink of an eye, the air changed forever. Early man put his own mark on the invisible world around him. The legacy of our ancestors includes not only prehistoric drawings on cave walls, but soot-covered ceilings left over from burning fires. As poets and philosophers made great strides interpreting the world around them, Air was left to the language of myth to explain its mysteries. Ancient Egyptians considered it a river between the heavens and earth. For the Greeks, who believed the world consisted of four elements, fire, earth, water, and air, air was primary because it could transform into fire and condense into water. Until the advent of modern chemistry, this view went largely unchallenged. In the 1500s, a physician's son, Philippus Theophrastus Bombastus, or Paracelsus, as he called himself, grew up watching his father treat sick miners, and he deduced that their illness came from the dirty air they were breathing in the mines. A radical view at the time. His views weren't exactly popular. It would be two more centuries before a major breakthrough changed our understanding of air. On the outside, Joseph Priestley was an upstanding man of the cloth. Let us pray. An English clergyman dedicated to his religious faith. But inside Priestley also beat the heart of a scientist. He would perform countless experiments in his spare time, even though he had no formal training in science. One of Priestley's experiments involved heating mercuric oxide. The result was the release of two different gases, which he called two kinds of air. He shared his experiments with a French tax collector and scientist, Antoine Lavoisier. It was Lavoisier who quickly realized that Priestley's two kinds of air were really two unique and distinct gases. Priestley and Lavoisier helped identify the principal components of air, nitrogen and oxygen. But the air also contained smaller amounts of other chemicals, an evolving recipe that would change radically during the Industrial Revolution. In the early 1900s in London, a new kind of air was described, smog. The word, a combination of smoke and fog, was coined by Dr. Harold Devoe 
to describe the thick, pungent air hovering over the city on polluted days. For the next several decades, air would continue to be a silent force until smog screamed across the headlines. Donora is a one-stoplight town in the southwest corner of Pennsylvania. It's hard to imagine that this sleepy place was once a thriving steel mill town and home to 14,000 residents. During Halloween week in 1948, a blanket of air trapped the smoke and toxic fumes belching out from Donora's steel and zinc factories. It was just a pure yellow fog that smelled like sulfur. And you couldn't see the street lights. You couldn't see any cars. You could see nothing. It was just this yellow fog. It was an unusual phenomenon that persisted over several days, killing 20 people and leaving hundreds evacuated or hospitalized. Well, one of my dear friends was a doctor, and she had charge of it. Um, Jane said there wasn't anything to do. They just brought them in. I looked at them and said they're dead. And that was it. They just kept them there till the funeral directors could take care of it. They had to just stay there. Poor souls. A decade later, Donora's mortality rate remained higher than neighboring areas. Its long-term effects are still unknown. What happened in Donora was rare, but not unique. In 1952, an air pollution disaster descended on London, England. Christmas comes but once a year, but smog knows no calendar. In fact, like the unwanted guest, it always drops in when it's most inconvenient. The smog went creeping across the country, cutting down visibility, causing chaos in traffic, holding up Christmas mail, catching everybody by the throat in its cold, clammy fingers. When he visited the city at the end of the 19th century, in the middle of the Industrial Revolution, the Impressionist painter Claude Monet was enchanted by the myriad of colors he saw in the London sky. But the shimmering colors in Monet's masterpieces are, in fact, light reflecting off pollutants suspended in the air and fog. London's heavy skies might have stirred the creativity of a painter, but it was the Great Fog of 1952 that made front page headlines. A movie tone cameraman drove through fog-shrouded London to report on the traffic chaos. The great smog invasion affecting 30 counties has caused a major dislocation of rail services, with late arrivals and uncertain departures. While the few trains that are running serve to underline one of the causes of air pollution. It was Denora all over again, this time on a massive scale. Nearly 4,000 deaths were attributed to the killer fog. It's a menace, this choking, eye-watering smog. Could what happened in London happen in today's world? It's an easy question to answer, because it's happening right now. Shanghai, China, is one of the world's most polluted cities located near the geographic center of China. A place where residents wear surgical masks and the sky turns yellow for days at a time. The Industrial Revolution came late to China, but it arrived with a vengeance. And it is clearly no coincidence that respiratory illness is one of the leading causes of death. But the problem is not limited to one city in China. Satellite photos taken from space show us the Great Wall of China, but they also show us other things as well. Massive clouds of grayish matter, smog, drifting across all our continents, daily impacting the health of millions. While some of the smog is still created by the burning of coal for industrial purposes, more and more of it comes from our vehicles, the cars and trucks that burn fossil fuels. Ever since Professor Ari Hagensmith discovered the photochemical link between cars and air pollution, the total amount of smog worldwide 
has increased dramatically. So even in the areas where smog may not be visible, it is still there. A van load of commuters hits the morning traffic in St. Louis, Missouri. The internal combustion engines emit smog-forming pollutants into the air. Three days later, 700 miles away, hikers in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park breathe in polluted air from the van's fumes. A snowboarder on the slopes of Whistler Mountain in Canada. As he gasps for air, he breathes in pollution from one of China's industrial cities. Sound unbelievable? Maybe so. But scientists are only just beginning to discover how air currents are transporting pollutants from one corner of the globe to another. And this journey takes only a matter of days. During this voyage, much of the world's air eventually passes by right here at the South Pole, a vast expanse of ice. No cars, no industry, no cities, which makes it the ideal place to study air pollution. One of the things we can do in the, in the Antarctic, and in Greenland, in fact, is to drill deep into the ice. And because as snow falls in through the atmosphere, it collects some information about the climate state and how, about pollution in the atmosphere, and it's then laid down on the surface as snowfall, and the snowfall builds up year after year, and it doesn't really melt in the polar regions. So the ice just builds up year after year and just into a big, thick sequence, up to two miles thick, the ice in the Antarctic. And we can drill from the surface down deep into it. And as we drill down into the ice, we're effectively going further and further back in time. Here, a team of atmospheric scientists drill through the thick layers of hard-packed snow at the South Pole. And we, I'm digging for old air. In fact, there's no other source of old air on the planet except locked in the ice. Buried at Dome C, deep beneath the surface are pockets of air frozen in time for over a million years. The scientists' goal? To retrieve and capture this trapped air in small canisters and send them back to a lab for analysis. It's just one way to get a glimpse of how dramatically our air has changed since the last ice age. What I'm doing now is I'm taking a thin slice of the core in order to measure the, the chemistry of the ice. So what we're looking for here is the pollution in the atmosphere, the chemical pollution in the atmosphere rather than just the gases. So we can actually tell you the real atmosphere of 800,000 years ago. If I will take a piece of ice and pop it into some hot water for you, you'll be able to see these little tiny bubbles bursting and coming to the surface and I'll be actually releasing air that was last circulating around the atmosphere thousands of years ago. Dr. Robert Mulvaney and his team have chronicled a steady and disturbing rise in global pollution. Of critical concern are the recorded levels of carbon dioxide trapped in the ice core samples. One of the things we can see is the levels of carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere. Now these are what we call greenhouse gases. These are the things that are causing climate to change today. These are the things that you worry about, the carbon emissions from things like burning fossil fuels or using your car to drive to work or to school or whatever. They release these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere like carbon dioxide. And we know this causes the temperature of the atmosphere to start to warm. We call this global warming or climate change. Now, if we look back over the past 800,000 years, we know what the natural levels of carbon dioxide and methane are, the natural levels of the, car of the greenhouse gases. And today, we're very, very much higher than we've ever been for the whole of that 800,000 years. This phenomenon has many scientists worried. Already, the effects of global climate change are evident. Once prominent glaciers have receded dramatically. In Montana's Glacier National Park, there are 26 glaciers left where only a century ago there were 150 glaciers nestled into the cliffs and peaks. In addition, several Antarctic ice shelves have collapsed, some disintegrating in the span of five days. As ice melts, sea levels will change. Scientists predict that over the next century, sea levels will rise in the range of four inches to three feet. Temperature variations will also cause increased damage 
from hurricanes, floods, fires, and infectious diseases. And the data collected by Mulvaney's team shows a convincing link between pollution in the air and the unprecedented climate changes our world is experiencing. But measuring carbon dioxide is only one of the indicators that show the air is changing. Air quality readings of other hazardous pollutants like ozone, sulfur dioxide, and particle pollution are taking worldwide at thousands of monitoring stations, like this one in Ventura County, California. The data in the United States is collected and forwarded to state and federal agencies, including the United States Environmental Protection Agency. This information enables them to determine which areas of the country do not meet government health standards for air quality. Today, more than 100 million Americans live in counties with unhealthful air. So how did we get here? How did this happen to an ecological system billions of years in the making? It's us, the way we live, our choices, our cars, our factories, our homes, the ships, trucks, planes, and trains that move us and our goods all over the world. Two days after she took her first breath, Maria Rodriguez is ready to go home. At the hospital, every effort has been made to ensure the newborn's perfect health. But now that she is going home, she faces the first major assault on her body's ability to defend itself from outside attacks. At home, in her family's backyard in East Los Angeles, California, she will not only breathe in the air, which her body's cells need to function, but she will also begin breathing in an odd mixture of chemicals and poisons, 20,000 breaths a day. Just 200 yards from Maria's house is the intersection of two major freeways. Thousands of cars and trucks pass over these freeways each day, while trains pour into a nearby rail yard, all spewing diesel fumes only yards from her crib. Today, more people die every year from air pollution than die from automobile accidents in the United States. And in fact, it's several times as many. Air pollution and its effects on human health is a subject that Harvard's Dr. Joel Schwartz has made his life's work. We're trying to do studies that show how we get from the particles in the air to the health effects so that we can see particles get in your lungs and there's more inflammation. More inflammation in your lungs and then we look at inflammation in the arteries. So we see particles in the air, more heart attacks. We're trying to get all the intermediate steps filled in and we're trying to document that every step of the process really is happening in people, so there can't be any doubt. In the Utah Valley, where over 250,000 people live, the effects of air pollution are crystal clear. Well, there's a steel mill in Utah that's in a valley in the middle of the mountains in the Rockies, and, and of course all those mountains trap the air pollution in the valley. But one year the steel mill went on strike and that winter, the air pollution concentrations were cut in half. The next year, the strike was settled, they went back up again. And when Arden Pope took a look at hospital admissions in the valley for pneumonia, for asthma, what he saw was the hospital admissions dropped dramatically the winter that the mill was closed and went back up again when the steel mill started up again. So, it was as simple as could be. You turn off the pollution and fewer people get sick. Because of this shocking transformation of our air, a new partnership is forming. Scientists, governments, corporations, and citizens themselves are taking action and creating innovative solutions to the problem of air pollution. This is one of our planet's youngest countries, 
geologically speaking, Iceland. This might seem an unlikely place for an air quality revolution, but that's the best description for what's happening on this tiny island of 300,000 inhabitants whose biggest industry is fishing. Iceland aspires to become the first nation on Earth to completely eliminate the burning of fossil fuels. But how does an entire country completely replace its dependence on oil? The answer lies in a gas that formed the basis for the creation of our galaxy 15 billion years ago, hydrogen. When exposed to oxygen, hydrogen creates a combination of electricity and water, providing ample energy to run a car, truck, or even a space shuttle without creating any harmful emissions. This adventure in Iceland is about displacing hydrocarbon out of our energy economy totally. We now have about 30%, 31% of our energy is imported hydrocarbons. In, in the post-World War II period, we displaced coal from heating Reykjavik by using geothermal. And in, the, in this new millennium we're now in now, we want to displace hydrocarbons from our economy by making our own domestically made hydrogen. In Iceland, the hydrogen will be generated using geothermal energy that naturally exists there. The, the earth is cooling off. See, 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 has to get, or it has to get rid of the energy some way. And the, the, the heat energy is dissipated through the plate boundaries and through volcanoes. Those are the sweating mechanism of Mother Earth. And actually what we are doing here, we are sitting at the plate boundaries. So we are sitting in the, the sweating organ, one of the sweating organs and topping off the energy. Which means that the production of hydrogen will not release any other harmful pollutants into the air. While fuel cell technology was originally developed for the U.S. space program in the 1960s, it has not become commonplace because hydrogen is difficult to produce and store in mass quantities in a safe, clean, and cost-effective manner. We have been offering Iceland as a platform for testing the hydrogen economy. So Iceland is seen, and we have the, our government with us in this, is seen as an international platform for testing this technology. Iceland is not alone in its pioneering spirit. Here at the EVS23 show, there are nearly 100 different alternative fuel cars on display, from solar powered to hydrogen fuel cell to natural gas and everything in between. They all share one thing in common, fewer harmful emissions. Even the hybrid vehicle, which uses a combination of gasoline power and electricity, cuts emissions dramatically. You know, we have to find creative ways of tapping into useful energy. I mean, energy is everywhere, but in terms of useful energy, there's only a certain finite amount of it. But we could use renewable technology and using them in creative infrastructure ways that we could create fuel for our use and be able to sustain ourselves. The important thing here is being able to sustainably develop and be able to meet that level of energy demand with the growing population. That's going to be the greatest challenge as we get to the future here. Is that population growth, it's, you know, year after year, it's growing and growing. Then that demand on energy is growing and growing as well. So we need to find a way that we could be able to provide that level of energy demand in a sustainable way, which has no harmful effect on the environment. In fact, if every vehicle on U.S. roads today were a hybrid, we would reduce air pollution by more than half. But motor vehicles are only part of the challenge. In Europe and America, the energy used to light, heat, and power our buildings and homes uses about 40% of all energy consumed, adding even more pollution to our air from power plants. Here in South London, an 84-unit development is proving that clean air starts at home. It's called BedZ. The Z standing for zero emissions energy. This is one of the most energy efficient places to live in the industrialized world. Walls 19 inches thick keep temperatures comfortable year round. Windows are triple glazed. A wind driven ventilation system feeds outside air into each house. 
all the time these buildings are breathing. They're sucking in fresh air from the roof and they're extra extracting stale air. But what's clever is the outgoing stale air preheats the incoming fresh air without cross-contamination. So these are healthy buildings, but they're also very thermally efficient buildings. That recovers 70% of the heat in the winter and gives you nice clean air inside the rooms. And whatever energy these homes still need after taking advantage of all these energy savers comes from a state-of-the-art on-site power plant. These simple innovations help shrink the amount of energy needed for daily living. Virtually every part of Bedzed has been designed to make it very easy to lead a low-carbon lifestyle. Or well, that's the idea. So that people haven't had to make a great um, effort. It's all just inherent in every single design decision. So for starters, you don't have to, if you don't want to, travel to work. You don't have to spend an hour and a half commuting to work. It, the, the workspace is integrated. There's enough desk space here for everybody who lives here to work here if they want to at some point in the future. The residents of Bedzed aren't eco-zealots. They are simply people who are at the forefront of a global trend toward reducing energy consumption in the home. We're consuming too many resources in the world, uh, and at the moment we're consuming more resources than the Earth can sustain, about 25% more. And if you look at that, you can actually divide that up into a fair share if you divide the, uh, the world population into this amount of land and leave a little bit for wildlife and wilderness. And that means that um, in the Europe, we're using three times as much as we ought to be using, which means that if everyone in the world lived like a European, we'd need three planets to support us. Whereas in the United States, um, even more resources are being consumed, unfortunately. I think because you have such a great lifestyle with the wide open spaces. Um, and if everyone in the world lived like the average American, then we'd need five planets to support us. So we need to look at reducing our resource use. And I think what we've shown here at Bedzed is that you can actually reduce your uh, resource use down to a one planet level without compromising on your quality of life. In the United States, new green communities are being constructed and individual homes are also being retrofitted so that energy-efficient technologies become standard practice throughout the housing industry. But what if you don't live in an energy-efficient community like Bedzed, and you don't drive an alternative fuel vehicle? Are the rest of us powerless in helping to transform the air around us? Angelo Logan doesn't think so. Angelo is a mechanic by trade. He has lived in Maria's neighborhood all his life. A neighborhood that is home not only to 13,000 residents, but also home to the 710 freeway, considered the busiest freeway in the United States. Well, it's become a, a cross a, a intersection of goods movement, uh, with diesel trucks and diesel trains intersecting the community and uh, spooning out black soot throughout the neighborhood. Every day, over 47,000 trucks pour into this community bringing cargo from the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach to a transportation hub where they will be shipped out to the rest of the country. In fact, over 50% of all the products imported from Asia come through Commerce California. So wherever you live in the United States, you are likely to buy an item that has traveled on the 710 freeway. I moved here in 1945 uh, behind my home were Japanese farms. Since then, trucks are within 10 feet of our home. Uh, noise, lights, and total pollution because of the trains idling. Some nights they idle from night to morning. But the railroad's not going anyplace, and the homes are still there, and we've got sickness. I just feel like I'm contaminated by a bunch of stuff because that's just scary, having 47,000 trucks coming and just driving right past your house and by everyone else's house. Physicians and scientists at the nearby Keck School for Medicine at the University of Southern California have been charting the health of all the communities that border the 710 freeway for over 20 years. Over the last several years, there's been an increase of uh, respiratory illnesses in children and elderly, um, asthma, bronchitis, 
and uh, uh, elevated level of cancers. A lot of my um, close friends, fathers, and parents have been diagnosed with terminal cancer. But long before Angelo had this concrete evidence, he became an environmental advocate. His title, Project Director for the East Yard Communities for Environmental Justice, obscures Angelo's straightforward mission. Cleaner air for healthier lives for everyone, no matter where you live. My feeling is we need children, young adults, to know about the green and to get out in their community and fight for this pollution that's happening. You know, I just like the pollution to stop instead of moving because, you know, this is a great place. The East Yard Community Group has definitely had their voice heard throughout the region. Not only have they mobilized their own neighborhood, but have also joined forces with other organizations to make their concerns known throughout Southern California. Today, the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles, that once were considered to be major polluters in the area, are making international news as they bring new, innovative, clean technologies and green initiatives to their daily business practices. It's our air. We all breathe the same air. The port belongs to the people. The people are engaged and belong to the port. And so, since it's our air and we all have to breathe it, it's important that we help clean it up. I think it's a good example of when a community comes together, we can make a difference. We can uh, improve the quality of life for the local community and improve the air quality for the whole region in general. And so it's, it's only unique that we took action you know, several years ago, but um, I think that you know, other communities are very similar to this and can also take action as well. As his awareness has grown, he's become even more committed to making sure the health of every person in his community is being taken into account. You don't need a degree to know that the pollution kills and that pollution is dangerous for children to breathe. The more we learn about air, the more we discover. And, as it turns out, air really isn't invisible. It shows up in the visions of our great artists. It shows up in global health statistics. It shows up in new and cleaner technologies. And it shows up in the efforts of air quality visionaries, the residents of Bedzed in England, the island nation of Iceland, and countless others who continue to heal the air. But there are still profound questions for the future. What will our air be like 10 years from now, or a hundred. Breathe in. The search begins with you.